Good evening. Good evening and welcome very, very much to Conversations, where I'm pleased to be uh, welcoming to the program this evening two gentlemen who are unfortunately incarcerated in a maximum security uh, facility here in New York, the Metropolitan um, Correctional Facility. And I want to introduce the two guests and get right into a conversation we have a great deal to talk about. And if I may, on my immediate left is Vernon Bellacor. And uh, Mr. Bellacor is a... Um, uh, a leader, a uh, founding leader, leader of the American Indian Movement. I'm one of the original uh, founders, but uh, I'm a representative of the American Indian Movement. Okay, fine. Vernon, welcome very, very much. And on my far left is uh, Bob Brown, who was, I believe, a co-founder of the uh, AAPRP, the All-African People's Revolutionary Party, if I'm not mistaken. And Bob, welcome very, very much to the conversation. I wonder, maybe, Vernon, you could take it up here at the beginning and introduce us. You two fellows are in prison here having to do with the charge of a grand jury, uh, lack of uh, answering or answering properly to, or something, a subpoena of a grand jury having to do with Libya. Maybe you could fill us in a little bit on why exactly you two people are incarcerated in a maximum security prison here in November of 1988. And from that position, we do want to talk some about your own views in terms of politics and so forth. But maybe fill us in. How come you guys are dressed in brown and behind bars now? Well, first of all, of course, we... Uh we're here because uh, we refuse to cooperate with or to give testimony to a Reagan, Edwin Meese engineered federal grand jury uh, that was impaneled in Alexandria, Virginia, specifically to investigate the representatives of the People's Committee for Libyan Students, whose offices are in Virginia, and their relationships and friendships with the various Indian movements and the black movements in the United States. Uh, as uh, many people know, in uh, July, uh, six Libyan students representing the People's Committee for Libyan Students, two travel agents uh, were uh, arrested and charged with violating uh, supposedly their licensing understanding with the U.S. Treasury Department. Mm. That is, since the deterioration of relationships between the United States government and the Libyan people, uh, the Libyan embassy being closed in the United States and the American embassy being closed in the United States, in, in Libya, the students, in order to operate, had entered into some licensing understanding with the Treasury Department. They're alleged to have given financial support uh, to black and Indian movements, uh, particularly travel to Libya to attend the International Peace Gathering, which was held on the one-year anniversary of the immoral and brutal bombing of Libya on April 14th of 1986. One year later, an international peace gathering took place in Libya. And there was uh, an extension by the Libyan system to people to come to that? Right, and uh, this was an invitation by the People's Peace Committee in Libya mm -hmm. uh, through the Libyan students in Alexandria, Virginia, and Mr. Brown and myself were two of the principal organizers of the delegation of more than 200 people uh, from the United States, representing many of the church denomination, uh, religious leaders, uh, human rights leaders, uh, civil libertarians, constitutional uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, experts, who went to Libya on the anniversary of the bombing to say simply give peace a chance. All right, and, and people, other people, so the Soviet Union, Britain, other people have done that, have brought people to their shore for meetings such as this. Right. Nothing from Canada, new. from the United States, it's a... It's There's nothing, nothing inherently wrong in that, in fact, people going over there are sort of, in a sense, as guests of the Libyan system. Well, nothing wrong, in, in fact, is it's our constitutional <coughs> right uh, to yeah. be free of uh, intimidation, uh, the right of free association, uh, expression, and certainly travel, and to be free of censorship. Yeah, exactly. But let me just go a little yeah. further. All right, go ahead. The Libyan students uh, uh, were arrested, uh, eventually, Mr. Brown and myself and uh, Bill Means of the American Indian Movement yeah. were subpoenaed to come before this grand jury. Uh, when we arrived there, we realized that what we had to do was not to give cooperation or testimony to anything that Edwin Meese could be involved in, particularly uh, just a week before he declares himself innocent, innocent of felony crimes uh -huh. and resigns from office. Uh -huh. well, what is it that Edwin Meese can possibly ask us? Uh -huh. And so we refused to testify. We were given an ultimatum, become a collaborator and an informant for the federal government or go to jail. The Obviously the choice yeah. was easy for Mr. Brown and myself. We elected not to cooperate, not to testify, and therefore we've been sentenced to this federal maximum security prison uh -huh. for civil contempt. And we could stay here 
quite frankly, for the term of the grand jury, which we're told is possibly April of 1989. But we wonder if it's not beyond that as well. Good grief. That's really something. And that, that is even though, and that is, uh, you, you even did appear before the grand jury, but you wanted to take the Fifth Amendment. We appeared voluntarily, and, uh, but we took the Fifth Amendment. And felt you shouldn't be giving testimony that is going to work um, to the detriment of um, friends and colleagues and comrades and so forth, and you didn't want to well, first participate of course, in what students. you saw as a, a sort of fishing expedition or a witch hunt, maybe in the McCarthy era of neurology or something of that sort. You didn't want to. You tried to take the fifth and tried to do that. You couldn't do it because of use immunity or something like that. Is that another factor in terms of this? Is, do you understand what I'm saying? They're getting around the, the, the they're getting around the means by which the Fifth Amendment, which is a constitutional right, is being uh, abrogated. But it's clearly an effort on the part of the Reagan administration to roll back the hard-won rights and gains that the people in this country and around the world have fought for. I mean, this question of the right to travel to other countries, to see different systems, to see different people, to make common cause, to make peace, this right of free association, this right of free speech and of protest is a hard-won right Indeed. on the part of the people. I mean, uh -huh. For more than 70, 80 years, people have fought for it just in terms of even the expenses of our own community, the black community. Uh -huh. W.B. Du Bois fought for this. Uh -huh. The right to travel to Africa, to the Soviet Union, to China, to North Korea, to see the billion systems and to call for world peace. Marcus Garvey in the 1920s fought for this right. The right of Africans, black people, people of African descent in the Western Hemisphere to become one, to work with, to join with African people on the continent. Paul Robeson, yeah. who was a victim of the McCarthy era in the yeah. 1950s. I mean, Martin Luther King, for example, Malcolm X, we can just go on and on in terms of our experiences as a people in this country. I know that of the Native American people, of the, in the peace movement and you know, the left community, yeah. have fought for it. And that what this administration, following in the path pioneered by the Nixon administration, has begun to whittle away those hard-won rights and those hard-won gains, whittling away the Constitution. Uh -huh. One of the tactics which they use is the grand jury, that the grand jury becomes an instrument of the FBI. It ceases to be a protector of the rights of the individuals vis-a-vis -vis an oppressive government, but becomes an instrument of that repression in that government yeah. to collect information, to compel testimony that the FBI and other agencies are incapable of gathering this type of information. So they give you something which they call use immunity, which is partial immunity, which is so-called immunity that the information which you give cannot supposedly be used against you. But then they trick you. They use my testimony against a Vernon, use Vernon's testimony against mine, for example, as a the attempt to manipulate and to use people, to entrap people, to make people become agents, you know, uh -huh. of, of this repression. The, the assumption being that, or the effect of it, I'm saying, is that it abrogates totally the Fifth Amendment right. Yeah, that's a very, very serious business. Yeah. And we will see even some of the right-wing and corrupt forces inside of this country not falling for this gimmick and this trick. Yeah. If you look at the current Iran Contra Gate scandal, for example, you will see so many of the forces who were given, I mean, Oliver North was given his Fifth Amendment rights, uh -huh. yet we were denied our Fifth Amendment rights. That's amazing, yeah. You know, Michael Diva was given the right, you know, to, to Fifth Amendment on certain issues and quote use immunity on other issues, uh -huh. but then he goes before a grand jury and a congressional committee and he lies. Uh -huh. He purges himself. He was convicted of perjury uh -huh. three times. Uh -huh. Yet the judges give him leniency. They wow. do not put him in jail yeah. because jails are overcrowded and he's a so-called alcoholic. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's some sort of a some sort of a system like that. And the, the use of this grand jury with the use with the immunity. Uh, is something that civil libertarians and constitu people concerned with constitutionalists, even you would say conservative people, ought to be concerned with is whittling away the basis of individual rights and the sanctity of the Constitution. I think a great number of people would be concerned with that. If the Constitution really did hell, 
uphold in its intention and the Fifth Amendment was granted to you in that sense, you'd be walking around outside now, right? Don't it, you become, believe, yeah. it becomes even dangerous because one of the students, I mean, one of the lawyers for the students' committees was also initially subpoenaed and compelled to testify. And just sitting in the courtroom while there was a hearing about whether or not they should be held in contempt, clearly it became a question that the government was also <coughs> trying to deny the client attorney privilege, mm -hmm. the right to be able to consult with your attorney, to you know, give certain testimony, certain information to your attorney, which would then be privileged information that the government was even trying to deny the right of the Libyan students the privilege mm -hmm. and the right yeah. to consult with their attorneys. Yeah. And the attorneys clearly said that if the government chose to hold them in contempt, they would also voluntarily go to jail to protect and defend their client attorney privilege. Yeah, it's no wonder in a certain sense that we've had people, Tawana Brawley, didn't want to testify yes. before Mr. Abrams' grand jury. Uh, another fellow, Clayton Patterson here yes. in New York City, we went and did an interview with Clayton Patterson where there was a grand with Diana Seward who did the taping with me, I'd like to mention that. Uh, we, we did an interview with him and he wanted not to give tape over to the grand jury because in a sense he said you can't trust the system in a very real sense. People in general are going to feel as though they're going to be adversarial to the system and the system is going to be used to cover up or is going to be used to protect people who are well established within the society rather than serve justice so that the faith in the system as it operates, the constitutional system, is being eroded and being signs of that in many cases. Yours is a prime example of that, don't you think? Well, one of the things I would like to emphasize is what uh, Brother Bob has touched on, you know. Uh, uh, these places are not for the Beavers or the Nofsingers or the Edwin Nieces who can, as I said, Alan Dale. can resign, uh, declare himself innocent of felony crimes and resign from office. Mm. But they certainly found room for Bob Brown and I. Yeah. And we're here, of course, uh, basically because we feel very strongly that there are some very uh, uh, fundamental principles that have to be defended here. And we as Indian people have this constitution imposed on us yeah. as a colonized nation, uh -huh. as a colonized people. Uh -huh. Nonetheless, the Constitution obviously does not work for Indians, and in this case, blacks, and certainly when we see the treatment that the Libyan students mm -hmm. were given by this system, it certainly doesn't work for the Libyan students or for Arabs in general. Yeah, you know, and in a certain sense, you, you've both been to Libya, you both associate with the Libyan revolutionary movement and what they're attempting to do in a positive sense. Do you think that the American people have been, in a certain sense, misled? by the government uh, with disinformation and telling distruths about that country and perhaps by the media to believe that that's some seat of terrorist uh, danger or something of that so they've been misled and they're trying to keep people from going to Libya is because they're in a certain sense afraid of that revolutionary movement. I wonder, why do you think they're singling out Libya so in terms of bringing this kind of uh, irrational in the minds of many disinformation campaign to get a misunderstanding of what's going on in that particular country. Well, let me comment on that briefly, and then I'm going to ask my brother here to elaborate on yeah. it. But in order for any of your listeners to understand this program yeah. and for it to make sense to any of them, they have to understand the history of the Central Intelligence Agency and America's foreign policy. That the stabilization of Cabo Arbenz, a Democratic president in Guatemala in 1954, the destabilization of the Allende government in Chile. We could go on to the Mossadegh government, the democratic government in right. Iran, and then they imposed the Shah, mm -hmm. imposed a series of brutal regimes on the people of Guatemala, where a Holocaust is being perpetrated on the Indians of Guatemala right now. Mm -hmm. They have to understand that the Central Intelligence Agency, the Reagan administration in particular, and many willing and unwilling pawns knowingly and unknowingly in the major media in this country, newspapers and television are doing the American people a real disservice. They are frankly perpetuating a campaign of lies and distortion, mm -hmm. utilizing what I have referred to as the rhetoric of genocide mm -hmm. to dehumanize, to vilify, to destabilize the Libyan uh, peoples and their leadership in order to overthrow this revolution because the Libyan people out front give support and aid to every revolutionary movement in the world who are justly struggling for their liberation against exploitation, domination, and war. Unlike the United States who sneaks in the death squads from El Salvador and from Guatemala 
and from other brutal regimes into Fort Benning and other military installations and train them in the torture techniques to send them back to perpetuate this violence against their own people. And it's for these reasons that people have to understand this massive campaign of lies and distortion. The American government and many segments of the American media are perpetuating this campaign of lies and distortion against the Libyan people. Against the Libyan people and the revolutionary movements that were trying to overthrow an unjust status quo, which in a very real sense is led in the minds of many people by the United States government. The United States government is in very real sense the bad guys, to use a simple term. Americans don't want to think that, but that is thought by many, many peoples around the world, revolutionary movements that are looking at that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right, it's hypocritical yeah. for the United States, on one hand, supporting the forces of Renamo in southern Mozambique, which has claimed more than 200,000 victims, supporting the forces of UNITA in southern Angola, supporting the brutal regimes in El Salvador, Chile, Guatemala, and of course, supporting the brutal repression of the Palestinian people. It's, it's hypocritical for the United States, but they very cleverly use the rhetoric of genocide. Everyone else is a terrorist. In this case, they're trying to isolate Libya as being the seat of terrorism. Yes, Yet there's no proof that they were involved in anything that happened in Austria. Mm -hmm. There's no proof that they were involved in the so-called Berlin Disco incident. Well, and very little proof that they were involved in anything that happened in Rome. Yeah. Yet they can perpetuate the lie long enough where people tend to begin believing it. Yeah, and trying to sit, point paint them as a terrorist nation in a certain sense by associating you and your camaraderie, your friendship with the Libyan, perhaps trying to bring that terrorist brush back to the movements that you gentlemen are leading both here in the United States and around the world. But I think it's a little bit even more insidious than that. All right. I think it is first of all a question of oil. That the United States government and certain major multinational corporations, mainly Occidental Petroleum, led by Armand Hammond, Hunt Oil, led by Bunker and the Hunt family, and Bechtel, the major construction company, are really the architects and, and the geniuses behind this policy of terror and destabilization and murder with respect to Libya. And they are the reasons why we are sitting in jail here today. They are the reasons we were sitting here in jail because in a very real sense, their interests were uh, hurt oh. by the Libyan revolution back in 1969. Yes. And that represents Mr. Um, Weinberger, I think, and yes. Mr. Meese, and uh, a good number Schultz. of people who've been in the Schultz, who've been in the Reagan administration. It's basically when Brother Gaddafi and the Libyan Revolution came to power in Libya, they nationalized the oil. Mm -hmm. And they began to use the resources and the riches of the country to, one, benefit the people themselves inside the country, and to, two, give aid and assistance and support to other oppressed and struggling peoples around the world. Okay. And the Reagan administration in particular has a vested interest in regaining control of this oil. Okay. We, we, Bob, excuse me, we have to take a break. We have to take a break and show a couple of uh, PSAs and so forth. So why don't we come back, pick right up on that point when we come back. Please please do stay tuned in the, uh, in the television audience. We'll be coming right back, interview with Vernon Bellacor and, uh, and Bob Brown. Please stay tuned. We'll be coming right back after these messages. Thank you. It's easy to think one person can't make a difference, but 200 million people can. If every one of us volunteered just five hours a week to the causes we care about, if we all donated just 5% of what we earn, there'd be almost no limit to what we can do. Just five hours, just 5%. When you think about it, it's not that much to give. And what we could get back is immeasurable. Back again now with Vernon Bellacore and Bob Brown. Bob, you were just saying you feel that there was this nationalization of the oil over there had it had to do with the fact that the United States government, particularly under Mr. Reagan, has in a singly, a singular kind of way targeted for propaganda or for painting as terrorists and so forth uh, um, with his anti-terrorist foreign policy grounding statement rather than a concern with human rights that Mr. Carter had but they particularly targeted Libya among all yes. the nations of the world that don't necessarily you know, feel a close association with this country. And you think it has to do with the fact that we nationalize some oil over there and that kind of thing that yeah, I mean, they're particularly all, uh, vehemently opposed to Libya? First of all, it is a fact. Exposed by Washington Post, New York Times, Newsweek, Time Magazine, and a whole host of other media that on January 21st, 
the day after Reagan accepted inauguration, he had a meeting of the CIA, the National Security Council, the FBI, the State Department, the Treasury Department, I mean, all of the major intelligence and international agencies and even domestic agencies. And they decided seriously and consciously to, quote, use the so-called fight against terrorism to replace Carter's struggle for human rights mm -hmm. as a policy. And they deliberately and consciously targeted Libya and to a lesser degree Iran and some of the other countries that we now see the United States government in confrontation mm -hmm. with. But they deliberately and consciously targeted Libya. Mm -hmm. And it has been a conscious and a deliberate seven-year policy of destabilization of attempted overthrow and sabotage of Libyan revolution and outright attempted murder and assassination of Robert Gaddafi. Yeah, they did with that bombing raid. That was yes. an attempt, and Seymour Hersh made it absolutely clear it was an attempt to assassinate Gaddafi. It's clear. Mm -hmm. And disinformation, I don't know to use the words outright yes. lies, outright misleading violence. the American people and the press with outright lies in order to set their policy agenda. Much of the press began to get a little bit upset with that, but they had a conscious policy of doing that. Went to extreme lengths but to give a false picture of Libya, and one wonders why. But I would go further than that. The press really has not gotten upset. Mm -hmm. One can see that they have begun to be a little bit upset about the crimes committed against the Nicaraguan revolution. Mm -hmm. One can see they have begun to get a little bit upset about the scandal with respect to arms and hostages and money with respect to Iran. Mm -hmm. But even tonight, there is still a cold-blooded silence on the part of the American media and establishment with respect to the crimes against, committed against Libya. Mm -hmm. I was reading a book just last night in my cell called The Chronology, mm -hmm. where one of the public interest Scott research Armstrong, groups yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. put together a blow-by-blow, blow, day day-by-day chronology of the Iran-Contra scandal. And I would estimate that at least 3% of the chronology, and I was reading it until 3 o'clock this morning, mm -hmm. documents the crimes and the vicious distortions and disinformation and lies of this government trade against Libya. Mm -hmm. Yet you hear no loud outcry in, no. in the press mm -hmm. about what happened in Libya. You the hear bombing, the bombing and the whole the whole thing. The, yeah, attempted, right. the attempted murder of Brother Gaddafi. People seem to have gurgles, I don't know, a big lie. <laughs> People seem to have swallowed or accepted the idea, I mean, let's say the mass of the middle class and that sort of thing in this country, have accepted the idea that Libya somehow stands for terrorism and all the things black and evil that seem to want to be done. They seem to have worked. This well, is a very frightening you understand aspect. understand what I'm saying? It's a, yeah, well, yeah, it's a very frightening aspect. It's as if they had told this long enough, where even if they tend to begin to disbelieve it, they seem to take the position, I made up my mind, don't bother me with the facts because this is what I want to believe and I'm going to continue believing this. And I think it's a very frightening a condition that exists in America right now. Yeah, it's nice to have the bad guy that you can associate with uh, Gaddafi, the name comes trippingly to the tongue, the bad guy, Libya's the bad guy, and in right. fact, you get over there and you see the opposite is really the case. Right? See, I'm, I'm not so sure that this is exactly 100% the case with All respect right. to the situation now. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is why we're sitting in jail. Mm -hmm. Libya, according to the government's policy and plan, was to be totally isolated mm -hmm. inside this country and worldwide, politically, ideologically, economically, militarily. Libya, according to the U.S. government, was so isolated in their minds mm -hmm. that they could bomb it, they could invade it, they could harass it, they could destabilize it with impunity. Yes, right. They couldn't do it with Assad or some other country. Yet, tw within 24 hours, of the bombing of, Lib of Libya, the immoral and illegal bombing of Libya. Mm -hmm. Demonstrations erupted throughout the world, mm -hmm. maybe small, mm -hmm. maybe qualified, mm -hmm. maybe not the masses of the people, but demonstrations erupted in over 80 cities in this country that we can document, and over 40 or 50 countries around the world. This proves that the policy and the plan was not totally effective, number one, and it proved also that this ignorant, politically ignorant mass of people who had been lied to and confused really genuinely want to search for the truth. Mm -hmm. It was only a question of getting the truth to them. Yeah, right. The fact that we are sitting in jail is proof that the United States government's policy failed. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
anybody who's organizing the movement in this country knew how difficult it was to get the peace movement in this country mm -hmm. to listen to the truth about Libya prior to the bombing of Libya. Mm -hmm. How difficult it was to get the liberals even then, even then, yeah. inside the movement, mm -hmm. the so-called conscious people. To see that there might be something good going on over there, yeah. Right. Yet the mm -hmm. fact that more than 200 representatives of these various movements went to Libya mm -hmm. to at least see and hear and experience for themselves what was happening is proof that this policy had failed. Mm -hmm. And we are sitting in jail because we happened by accident of history, by volunteerism, to be two of the forces, two of the key forces, two of the targets who were able to organize and to convince these more than 200 people to make this trip to see for themselves. Yeah, and you were doing that early on. You could see there was that you, you early on went to Libya in violation of the executive order that the president came out illegal unconstitutional folks, uh, violation of travel there to do that. You were interested in that and there are other people who ha have become interested in their in, in, in Libya. Do you think it is that there is this irrational tendency on the part of the American government toward that is that they're it's such a small country, three to four million people, little country off to the side, that sort of thing, but such inordinate attention on them. Do you think, Vernon, it could be that there is a fear uh, somewhere maybe deep in the State Department or something beyond the geo strategy and beyond uh, thinking in terms of uh, the oil uh, the, and personal vendettas of oil companies who are nationalized, that sort of thing, that there's a fear that the idea of that Libyan revolution at the, idea, at the level of idea is something that they fear as being a threat to the way the Western world is established because Mr. Gaddafi has put forth a very revolutionary critique and perhaps an appropriate critique of the inequities that arise under our system in the West Capitol and also the communist system. And there's a fear of that at the level of idea, if you understand what I'm saying? Well, the ban on travel itself was a, a blatant attempt to censor the right of the people in America to travel to Libya to see for themselves the advances, the tremendous uh, uh, advances of this revolution and the ideas of this revolution. Mm -hmm. To see a small country of three and a half million one of the poorest countries in North Africa, who for 500 years had their country overrun by different imperialist forces, suffered genocide, uh, the had their economy. oil exploited by multinational North American corporations, were able to take their present and their future back, take their resources to provide health care, education and housing, which is a right and not a privilege. Which, they have, free, which they have accomplished. Which they have accomplished. Mm -hmm. And for people to see this, and I think more importantly, it's the idea mm -hmm. of the Third World Universal Theory mm -hmm. of Brother Momar al Qaddafi, mm -hmm. which is called the Green Theory. Mm -hmm. Green being all beautiful things that grow in the world, the flowers, the grass, the trees. That this revolutionary idea, which is based on the Universal Theory of Momar al Qaddafi, mm -hmm. Uh, that this revolution could spread, these ideas could spread. And ideas are very dangerous, particularly when oppressed and suffering peoples throughout Africa and throughout the world, throughout the Americas, our countries that have been overrun by five for 500 years, uh -huh. our resources are being exploited. We remain locked into chronic, chronic cycles of poverty, yeah. which breed despair, frustration, uh, high populations of our people in the prisons. Yeah. They don't want the idea of the Libyan revolution to spread beyond its boundaries. Yeah. And I, I have to agree with you that it's the idea that they're afraid, but it's the example that frightens them as well, and they want to isolate it. Yeah, and they critique, they critique the institutions of democracy, as we call them, democracy in our Western society, perhaps appropriately saying, you know, that uh, less than 50% of our people are going to vote. Our system is very concentrated, power at the top. Ownership is held in the United States by the upper 5% of the population own virtually all the assets in our economy. They advocate a dissemination of ownership of the means of production, uh, town meeting, real democracy, and so forth. So they, in a certain sense, turn our system on its ear, or upside down, and give a critique of it that might very well resonate with a whole lot of people within the American or Western societies if they could but think about it and, and, and hear what it is and think about it as an example beyond the propaganda and the, uh, the, the, the whitewash that's been put over that system by the American... It might be one explanation why there's so much negative propaganda directed at them, that's all I'm saying. It's clearly a question of the ideas. 
and the example is very important. But it's also a question of the solidarity and the coordination, worldwide solidarity and coordination of oppressed peoples throughout the world. It is not a question of the idea of spreading. They have already spread. They're all over the world. The masses of the oppressed people throughout the world want to participate in their own liberation, number one, but in also determining the kind of system, the kind of destiny that will solve the problems which they face. Mm -hmm. The revolution in the Philippines, which is not yet complete, mm -hmm. where thousands of people went to the streets to determine their own destinies. The struggles in Eastern Europe, and even the Soviet Union, where the masses of the people are in the streets debating and discussing all kinds of issues and all kinds of things that heretofore, you know, have not been part of what they have been allowed to discuss, the mm -hmm. notion of glasnost, mm -hmm. you know, the struggles of the people in Algeria in the streets, mm -hmm. wanting to revitalize and to revive the revolution, you know, that you know, came to power 20 or 30 years ago, and to have collective solutions, mass participation, the solution of the problems which they face. The children with stones in occupied Palestine, mm -hmm. it is democracy with whatever instruments you have. The children in Southern Africa who face bullets, mm -hmm. you know, fighting for the right to determine the way that they want to choose. These are simply forms of expression mm -hmm. that the people are using for democracy. You can even see it inside this country. The millions of people who voted for Harold Washington in Chicago, mm -hmm. not just the Democratic Party machine. The millions of people who thought that Jesse Jackson was the answer, mm -hmm. knew that he could not win, mm -hmm. knew he would not be president, mm -hmm. didn't care about any of that, but were in fact voting against the Democratic Party, against the system of exclusion and elitism and racism and classism, which heretofore had existed in this country. Genocide against the Genocide. Indian peoples? Yeah. The, the Lenora Falani campaign mm -hmm. and the other independent political movements and campaigns in this country where people are asking for an alternative, a new way, I mean, even inside this country. An alternative to the way an things are. The status quo that's accepted. It's interesting, he has an alternative not only to the Western view of a capitalist oriented society, the bipolar world of a Western yes. Marxist oriented Soviet Union and so forth brings that also into critique and says there has to be a third yes. way. There has to there be has some to be. third way of identifying the North South has to, the, the North, the, the developed world has to develop, you know, a better and open relationship with the developing world, the broader world, the underclass peoples of the well, world, would, if you will. Well, I would take a little further. Or, but there needs to be a new political dialectic. Mr. Jackson recognized yeah. that, but uh, well, certainly well, Omar Gaddafi does. And is offered it. Maybe they're afraid of that idea of there being a dialectic break with the status quo uh, interests and the, the the political party and jockey within the status quo assumptions or the epistemology or the ontology of that system that is there. Do you understand? There's a break with the past. There is a break. I mean, a revolutionary break with the past. I mean, mm -hmm. if I could use an example, it would be like a body of water, a pot of water sitting that if you look at the water under a certain condition, it appears to be placid on the surface. Mm -hmm. No conflict, no contradiction. To put a little bit of heat on the water, the water begins to bubble, it begins to boil, and then it turns to steam. Mm -hmm. And then what this country understands is that the mass phase of the struggle has erupted once again, worldwide this time, worldwide. I mean, the fact of people in the streets. I mean, sitting in this jail, I just saw on the news the other day, rebellions and riots in California. Mm -hmm. In California. Mm -hmm. All the incorrect things over drugs and other kinds yeah. of contradictions. Uh -huh. But it still begins to speak about the anger of the people mm -hmm. searching for a better way of life. I mean, you see all kinds of, like, you see demonstrations you've never seen in the last 10 years inside this country. Mm -hmm. You see, I mean, Haiti. Mass of the people are going to the streets. Yeah. And there is a debate once again with inside of the establishment, inside <coughs> the oppressors, yeah. on how to contain, co-opt, and crush this rebellion before it begins to get better coordination, cooperation worldwide. Worldwide, such as you were helping to build that kind of coordination yes. to get some power for that uh, for that for that for that for that kind of coordination. Yeah. They consider Libya to be a main target because it quote supports terrorism, mm -hmm. and they say that. Well, it quotes uh, it, it 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 supports quote major change. 
It's that are many, many people feel yes. is, a, is something that's really needed now. And right? it supports progress. And this, this, this kind of thing within the country, we're, we're, you know, within this country, that's being done in a situation which is supposedly fairly good times, I mean, in terms of unemployment rates and that sort of thing. Robbie Bachter and others have, have, have seen that we're likely to have a speculative bubble, we're likely to have something on the order of a depression or even a great depression could occur, which would bring about a uh, condition that might lead to even increased sense of the mass of the people wanting to look at the system in basic terms. And Muammar Gaddafi offers an analysis that might ring and resonate to many people's minds if they could but hear it. And they don't want that to be heard, perhaps, to people in the but system. Can I say, it's already resonating. Mm -hmm. It is no accident that the government targeted the Native American community and the black community, which once again, with the Puerto Rican community and other oppressed and third world minorities, is at the brunt of what's happening. Yeah. We did not vote for Reagan. Mm -hmm. He was not our great communicator. He mm -hmm. did not lull us and fool us into sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, even the most reactionary elements inside of our community know it is bad, it is worse today than it was 20 years ago mm -hmm. in terms of conditions inside of our community, the unemployment mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So they clearly and consciously understand that as the economic and political conditions get worse, the movement of the people will intensify. And, and, the, yeah, go ahead, and yeah. once again, these third world communities, headed up once again by Native American, Chicano, and Puerto Rican, and African, or black and in this country, mm -hmm. will be in the vanguard. Mm -hmm. And they are now trying to crush it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to crush it before it gives a chance yeah. to emerge. Let me go a little further than what uh, Bob is saying here. Uh, I told you already that the uh, the three incidents that are being investigated by this grand jury were the International Peace Gathering of April 14, 1987. The second event was the International Conference for the Liberation of the Indian Nations of the Americas, mm -hmm. which were held on January 30th through February 2nd of 1988, this year, which was hosted by the Libyan Peace Committees. Mm -hmm. It was a people-to-people -people relationship. Mm -hmm. This conference brought 160 three Indian leaders from Canada, the United States, Central and South America, people who are being brutalized and tortured today after a 500-year struggle. And the government of the United States knows that we are building a united front for the liberation of our Indian people, and we have every right to carry on whatever struggle is necessary in the interest of our survival. That cannot be denied. Mm -hmm. That we are the most oppressed, suffering people, along with our black brothers and sisters, descendants of slaves, mm. and the Latino or the Hispanic or the Chicano, whose grandmothers were all in there. And that can be writ large in a government that cares less and less about the homeless and the underclasses in our own society. That is written larger on a world scale where they care less and less about the people or have a system of addressing the needs of the uh, poor underclass peoples of the world with much less concern of it. And that's a problem the American people ought to be directing themselves to. Sorry, we've got to take another break here, okay? We'll come right back, pick this up, and uh, so forth, and uh, remind you in the television audience, your pleasure, reception of Vernon Bellacor, Bob Brown. We'll be coming right back after these messages. Please do uh, stay tuned. Thank you. When Fran fell, he called for help. But the only ones there were ignorance, incompetence, indifference. Fran called for help again. Confusion came instead. At last, help came. Help knew what to do. In times of emergency, are you help? Learn Red Cross first aid. Where you work, or call your local chapter. Back again now, Bob Brown and Vernon Bellacorn. And Vernon, you were going to take up a point that we were discussing. Yes, I wanted to say that it's absolutely essential to the future of our Indian people. Blacks, descendants of slaves stolen from Africa, Latinos, Hispanics, many who are the brunt of U.S. foreign policy in El Salvador against the people in Nicaragua, Guatemala, the Indian people are being massacred, even under the so-called democratic government imposed on the people of Guatemala by the United States. Mm. We know, and the U.S. government knows, that we have every right to carry on whatever struggle is necessary. Mm. So we are building a strategic alliance to carry our struggle forward toward liberation. And these are the reasons that this man, representative of the black movements, myself, a representative of the Indian movement, and now the Arab students are the principal targets of this latest wave of repression that has us in prison, 
has Salah al-Raji or Salah Juma, who was coerced and intimidated under the threat of espionage charges against he and his wife for allegedly being an assassination team against Oliver North, which allegation within the Justice Department is being exposed as a blatant lie. Another one. And yet this young man, Salah Juma, is going to be the fall guy. This brother and myself are going to be the Indian and the black fall guy, victims of the Reagan administration and this U.S. government and the CIA wave of repression. And there were there also uh, Stokely Carmichael was served, right? Or what? He's out of the country now. Though, he right? was not served yet. Uh -huh. They are looking for him, so they say. Uh -huh. They have a subpoena for him, but he lives in Africa, in Guinea and West Africa. He's been moving around the world, continuing our work, organizing. Yeah, yeah. He's not hiding. If yeah. they want him, they can come get him. Yeah, right, right. You know, but he has not been served yet, and therefore it's not Beyond the mall all over the country, yeah. Well, between you, the Indian movement, the black, and, and Arab, that's just about all the peoples of the world. We've got, uh, you know, in a certain sense, we've extended out. We've got, an, we, it's, it's interesting to point out, uh, we've violated practically every treaty that we established with the Indian nations, the European people who came and took over these continents and so forth. The long and inglorious history of decimation and genocide against the American Indian peoples and so forth, and it continues. And it's good to keep that keep that in mind. And then uh, the, the case of the black and so forth. But the, these are representing, in a certain sense, not only the United States and Canada, but also Latin America. You got Latin America. You got Africa. In a certain sense, you've got into Asia with a one billion people of Muslim faith. And it's good for the American people, the four or five percent of the people of the world in the United States who may feel secure, to realize that the respect and the sense of regard for the American nation, which Mr. Reagan may feel has been built with all his worship, we're losing ground in terms of the feeling of good feeling toward this country by the peoples of the third world that in a certain sense you're tangentially connected with, you understand. While the America, who we always see as the architects of apartheid, what is happening to the blacks in South Africa today has already happened and continues to happen against us here in the Americas. The American Holocaust has claimed all but perhaps six million of us in what is now called Canada and the United States. Mm -hmm. But from Central, South to South America, we number all the way from 80 to 100 million. Yeah. So in building this United Indian Liberation Front, we are working realistically toward our liberation. And I want to emphasize, we have every right to carry on that liberation struggle. No. Liberation struggle against the status quo forces that be, which are becoming increasingly Reactionary. And we're also building the strategic alliance between the black and the red mm -hmm. and the brown in this hemisphere and throughout the world. Mm -hmm. That the Indian Native American community, the Chicano or Latino or Hispanic community throughout this hemisphere, and the African or the black community throughout this hemisphere are in fact the future of this hemisphere. Mm -hmm. They are, in fact, the ones who, once we become better organized mm -hmm. and better conscious of not only our oppression and our history of resistance, but also our future, will, in fact, make the positive changes in, that are necessary and vital to this hemisphere. And that they clearly understand the government. This strategic alliance has existed for over 500 years mm -hmm. and is being deepened and developed and more intensified today and that it is through the assistance of the Libyan revolution that we're being able to communicate and to work together and come together in conferences and meetings to discuss our common problems and our common aspirations. Mm -hmm. And this is why they targeted us once again. And again, particularly the Libyan revolution among particularly. the revolutionary movements of the world, which gives a target to, to the administration, as it were, and might give heed to many people who were not that familiar with what the Green Book said, or what Mr. Gaddafi had said, tended to either laugh it off or write it off as, uh, as the propaganda had been given, might give more people to get themselves aware of what's going on over there, people who perhaps are progressively inclined or something like that, whereas they hadn't, they'd written it off. They really should maybe take a second look at that, because it could be a kernel of a nucleus for a real worldwide awareness and uh, questioning in a major dialectic way the status quo way in which the world is organized and resources divided and that sort of thing, perhaps. Huh? Well, the green theory, uh, which is embodied in the third world universal theory of uh, Muammar al-Qaddafi, uh, obviously is something that is 
growing, it's spreading beyond the uh, political boundaries of what we know as Libya. Uh, they call the Socialist People's Libya and Arab Jamaharia. Jamaharia Jam means? mean the authority of the masses, That's the right. state of the masses, where the masses of the people own the technology, own the resources, and in fact take the responsibility to not only produce, but as well to defend and to govern themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a concept where it takes away the authority from a few politicians, such as the case in the United States. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of the American people say no aid to the Contra, yet our congressional and Senate leaders of this system go to Washington and vote as they please. Mm -hmm. This is not true democracy. It's, a, it's a, a facade, it's an image of democracy. They use word games, they say it's a democracy, but in no sense of the word is it democracy based on the principles of which the Indian people lived a very purest form of democracy that took into consideration the rights of the individual mm -hmm. over the rights of government. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is one of the fears that this government has is that this third world universal theory of the state of the masses, authority with the masses where the people govern themselves versus having a few politicians uh, in two political parties such as the Democrat and the Republican who only change uh, their duty at the helm from time to time. But in the meantime, the Democrats and the Republicans continue to not serve the best interests of the vast majority of the people in this country. And certainly, they don't serve the interests of the poor, suffering, oppressed peoples in Central South America and elsewhere in the world. Nor do they have, if I may say so, a vision by which the interests of the masses of the world, the third world, or the ownerless peoples of the world, are, they're going to be able to relate and resonate with the needs of the poor peoples of the world. They don't have a political philosophy. They don't have an economic philosophy that allows them to truly do that. If you're a Marxist, you at least have an epistemology that relates to the needs of the underclasses, the underprivileged peoples of the world. And so what we don't have that in, in, in any measure. We don't have that kind of a system. And it's very dangerous for a country that is as powerful as this one, with atomic weaponry and so forth, not to have a vision that can resonate to the needs of the underclasses of the people, because that question is going to be one that's going to be emerging as a central one, confronting the continuation of the human community as we begin to look ahead. We need a philosophy like that. We don't have it, and it makes us very, very dangerous. Perhaps the most dangerous political force in the world is the United States of America. That's something people don't want to think. We like to think of this country as being the source of light and good, but Blackhawk, one of our, I'm sorry, but Blackhawk, one of our great patriots in the 1800s said uh, very prophetically when they were being forced, forced to submit to the forced violence and terrorism of the United States government, he said, why is it you Americans always insist on taking with a gun what you could have through love? Mm -hmm. Now we talk about America's free enterprise system. From our viewpoint, this economic and political system can only perpetuate itself on the basis of free land, free labor, and free resources or free product, mm -hmm. which are taken at the point of a gun from the peoples of Guatemala, El Salvador, want to force the people of Nicaragua to submit. And uh, this is the only way that this economic and political system can perpetuate itself, almost like a parasite, which lives off the land, labor, and resources of other people throughout mm -hmm. the world. Yeah. And once it becomes isolated by its own failing foreign policy, only then are the masses of the people in the United States going to rise up and take back their present and their future. Well, that's what makes it dangerous. they got all these weapons in the hands of people that are likely to feel encircled but, at but some point. the most point. important weapon is the people. All right. It's the loyalty, the understanding, and the loyalty of the people. Uh -huh. That's the most important. And I want to agree with Brennan. They do have a philosophy of how to deal, how to relate to suffering and poor and oppressed people. What and is that? Is, and that is to continue their suffering and their oppression. Uh-huh, make it even worse. To make it, it even worse. Yeah. And it is this value judgment, this epistemology, or this ideology around which they've organized the system inside of America and the world, which is going to be the cause of their failure. Well, we have a world that is increasingly technologically oriented in the production of many of the goods of civilization, of, uh, of uh, economic goods. We have robotics coming. We have other kinds of things that can produce material goods. The ownership of the means of production is held by about the upper 5% of the population in this country. 95% of the people are only able to receive income for living by uh, monetarist wage slavery trickle-down. 
And that kind of a model, rather than investing ownership in the people of the means of production, yes. there's no way open for them to do that. Uh, and this is a thing, and it's becoming increasingly concentrated. The ownership, the people at the bottom are being increasingly squeezed, and it's going to create a real problem. We don't have that kind of a again, philosophy to spread ownership among the people at an economic level. And way. again, this is why the government here is afraid of the green theory. Mm -hmm. Because it raises these fundamental questions that the means and the products of the production must be owned and controlled by the people themselves. And that, we, that the people must become partners mm -hmm. so to produce a better quality and quantity of life and not slaves or so-called wage earners. Yeah, we, he, Muammar Gaddafi uses the term wage slaver. Anyone who receives their income by wages is a wage slave. That's 95% of the people in our society probably don't think of themselves as wage slaves, but in fact they are, particularly as technology is increasingly responsible for production. It's all owned by a few people at the top and they want to maintain it that way. You know, well, it's just a, a question. And it makes it particularly dangerous that we don't have a philosophy that allows us to relate to those needs because it's going to become the major concern of the world we begin to look ahead. Let, let me, you know, just follow up on one more point. I am convinced as I sit here with Vernon and the other forces and people around the world who are supporting us that the government has made a very real mistake. That if they had simply arrested and persecuted the Libyan students alone, it would have because of the low level of understanding of the masses of the people in this country and worldwide about the truth of the Libyan revolution. It would have been more difficult to raise support, to raise defense. For them, they were isolated. For yeah. the Libyan students, they would yeah. have been more isolated. But the government made the mistake, the dual mistake, of number one, violating constitutional and other rights, which forces movement and other people and organizations in this country and throughout the world who may or may not agree with the Libyan revolution, but who out of their own set of principles and their own interest must protect and defend these hard-won constitutional and other rights. It forces them to take a second look. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, while not nice, it is an accident of history. But I'm honored to be sitting here to be one of that instruments and vehicle with Vernon. Mm. They made a mistake. No, they made a mistake because the Indians and the Africans, the black in this country, and to, whom we symbolize in jail for this reason at this point in time. Uh huh. And then some other people like myself might pick up on that, and other people might pick up on it. Well, they should. Other people should pick up and let more and more people know about this. I don't want to close the program without knowing, I don't like the idea of you guys being in here without being able to walk around free like you ought to be able to do and all that sort of thing. Uh, there are people who want to be in continuing support or in continuing communication can write to you and there's a fund or there's an organ committee and maybe we should let the people know where they could write who want to have uh, continued contact with you all. Well, it's the National Committee uh, to Support uh, Grand Jury Resistance a Defense Fund. National Committee to Support Grand Jury Resistance 2020 Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest, Suite 274, Washington, D.C. And I think the zip is 2005. Maybe I better repeat it. Well, no, that's National all right. We'll, okay. We'll put, it up, we'll put it up on the screen so people well. can get that sort of thing. Could I, could I just make maybe two quick points Absolutely about this not. National Committee? It is not simply a question of us. First of all, it is a question that there are a number of movements in this country who are facing the intensified repression in general and the grand jury form of repression in particular. The Puerto Rican movement, for example, which is devastated mm -hmm. by this grand jury attacks. The sanctuary movement, the movement of religious people in the Southwest who are providing haven and asylum and refuge for the Indian and Hispanic forces who are fleeing persecution in South America certain sectors of the African or black liberation movement in this country. The peace movement, as it was in the 1970s, once again is increasingly undergoing repression and attack. Especially the more progressive and anti-interventionist, anti-CIA, solidarity wing of the peace movement. So the purpose of this grand jury support committee is to begin to link and network and coalesce all of these forces who are bearing the brunt 
of this new wave of repression inside of America, mm -hmm. to go on the offensive against this new wave of repression, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, we are not here alone. Mm -hmm. We are here with the tremendous and overwhelming support of our movements and our organizations and our allies and other aggressive forces throughout the world. I mean, it even becomes a kind of a pot for it mm -hmm. of support. Mm -hmm. We have the support of the independent political movement forces in this country, for example, epitomized by Sister Lenora Falani and the other left and progressive political movements and parties in this country who are supporting us. We have the progressive wing of the peace movement, represented and epitomized by Dave Dillinger, mm -hmm. the civil liberties movement, you know, William Kunstler mm -hmm. and Ramsey Clark and Nick Bodine and you know, Francis Boyle, you know, mm -hmm. the, black, the black lawyers and mm -hmm. the progressive lawyers and whatnot. You know, we have okay. the Puerto Rican movement, and we even have the beginnings of consciousness and a stirring among Jesse Jackson. Even among Jesse Jackson? Even among Jesse Jackson, he must come ultimately for our support. This might even get out to a college uh, class, young uh, college uh, students and so forth that have been so quiet and so long along with things. It might even spike a, uh, a sense of involvement among the young people who've been so quiet and going along with systems in this country, which could be... Uh, a very, very dangerous thing from the standpoint of some people's perception. And we, are, we are in good company here, too, incidentally. And yes, America, there are political prisoners in America. Uh, here we have Filberto Ojeda Rios of the Puerto Rican independence movement. We have Nelson Ramirez. We have Joe Doherty, who's fighting extradition to England. All uh, here in, within the house? Yes, in, in, this, in this facility, right here on 9 South. Yes. Uh, of which we were placed in segregation mm -hmm. with for nothing more than having a spiritual fast when we arrived here. And so, you know, the point that uh, uh, Bob was bringing up about the tremendous solidarity that's building, and within the National Committee to Support Grand Jury Resistance, we are asking the participation of all these different uh, independence forces, liberation forces, to join us in resisting grand jury abuses. Okay, fine. It's a point. It's a point to focus on these things. Well, uh, then, right to that, we can do what you do. We can do what we can to help try and get you out of here. I want to thank you really thank very, you much very much for all your work and also for participating okay, in the series. And I will remind you in the television audience, it's been your pleasure to have receptions again then. Vernon Bellacore, uh, leader of the American Indian Movement, and Bob Brown, co-founder of the uh, AAPRP, the All-African People's Revolutionary Party. Uh, happy we've been able to bring you those perceptions. We're in conversations. Invite you to tune in uh, again next week. We'll be coming back again next week. That's it for this particular segment. We'll, we'll be seeing you next week. And gentlemen, once again, thank you really very, very much. Keep the faith. Good night. We'll see you next week.